Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be gathered together for worship. It's good to be here in the Lord's house to lift up His name, worship Him together. So uh, we got a few announcements. Not a whole lot going on, but we do have a few announcements. Um, we're not doing the children's uh, small group videos anymore. The last one of those was last week, uh, so we don't have that going on anymore. We're we're done with the Zoom and everything. We're kind of back to in person here. And so uh, be sure and encourage one another. If you look around and see people who aren't here, uh, give somebody a call, write them a card, send them a text. Uh, just keep encouraging one another as we continue to, to worship and serve the Lord together. I know different people have different circumstances that they're not here with us. And so uh, we just want to encourage everybody that way. So I want to encourage you to do that, uh, to lift one another up that way. Uh, we do have a need right now. There's an opportunity to serve. Uh, and that is that our grass has come out. It's growing and we could use your help. Uh, mowing it guys and so if you're sitting around with nothing to do looking for some way to fill your time you know and you're cold you can get out here and mow a little bit you know warm you right up that'd be great uh, but we've got a sign up sheet on the back if you want to do that you can do that all right uh, don't forget to give you can give in the offering box at the back for those of you that might be watching at home you can give uh, by sending it through the mail and then also uh, we're planning vacation bible school that's coming up at the end of July, and so we'll be contacting you guys. We've had some people already tell us uh, that they'd like to serve in different areas that they might like to serve in. And so if that's you, uh, be sure and let us know, and we would love to get you involved in that. All right? Okay. Well, we're going to begin our time of worship now. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless us as we worship Him this morning. Father, we thank you. For the day that you've given to us today, we thank you for having a nice, cool place where we can come and gather together to worship your name. We've got brothers and sisters in other parts of the world that don't have these advantages. But God, you are faithful and true to us all. And God, we, we see you as one who is worthy of worship and praise. And so we want to give you the honor that you are due this morning. So we ask that you would help us to focus on you, that this time wouldn't be about us but that it would be about you and that you would do the work in us that we need. God, we pray for your correction, for your encouragement. Um, God, we pray that you would have your way in us. We thank you for all that you are and for all that you do. And it's in your name that we ask these things. Amen. <laughs> Oh, 
parts of the world and what God is doing there and lift up our brothers and sisters in prayer. So would you share with us this morning? Um, here in the United States, we have the International Mission Board and who supports people who are called to go and serve Jesus, serve God. Um, in the Ukraine, um, there's a team for this and they are called Harkov. And um, the team Harkov has sent the cancellation of our planned outreach through multiple volunteer teams over the summer and fall months, so they've canceled that. Yet the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of the Ukrainians, is including hundreds and thousands who are still displaced by the war that continues to the South, have multiplied during the pandemic and the quarantine in Ukraine. Intercede for our team, they say, as we speak, seek the Lord's wisdom to continue to minister alongside our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in multiple region, regions in eastern Ukraine to proclaim Christ through word and deed. Pray that the Lord will continue to raise up Ukrainian believers with a vision for reaching those living along the conflict line who are desperate for the hope and help that only Christ can bring. Let's pray together this morning. God, we uh, thank you for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine who worshiped you earlier today. God, we thank you for the missionaries who have been called out and left their homeland to go and serve. And God, we do pray uh, that our brothers and sisters would be raised up, that you would empower them and embolden them and help them to share the good news with the people in their country and to uh, have an idea of how to reach those that are in such great need, adding war on top of the pandemic and everything that's going on, God, we pray uh, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would continue to go forward in the Ukraine. God, we pray uh, that you would be glorified in all things so that people might worship you and find you faithful and true. And it's in your name that we ask all these things. Amen. <laughs>
God's Word and listen to what the Lord has to say to us this morning. This morning's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Uh, as you guys know, Paul wrote this to the church of Rome. It says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to even die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God <clears throat> through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Amen. The song declares the reality that Christ is everything to us. So we want to lift that up to him this morning.
Bible this morning, I would invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. A few weeks ago we wrapped up our series on John and we've been talking about, um, you know, how to live in the world that we're in today for the last several weeks, just where we find ourselves in a strange period of life. And this morning we're going to look at uh, an issue that has become really significant and we would just want to nail down what it is that the Bible really has to say on the issue. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, and we're reading as uh, Paul is sort of unfolding the truth of God's Word as it pertains to salvation. This really is a book about the cross of Christ, what it is that Jesus has done, what he has accomplished, and the, the difference that that makes. And then there's some practical implications that he gets into you know later in the book we're going to zoom in on ephesians 2 and we're going to look at verses 13 through 19 uh, to see the implications of the cross for one specific kind of circumstance and area of life and then uh, we'll kind of look at what that is together so why don't we just read it together we'll read the whole thing and then i'll pray and ask for god's help and then we'll go back and see what God has for us in this truth today. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you who are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Let's pray together this morning. God, as we come before your word, we want your word to be the rule of our thought. We want you to correct us. We don't read the Bible with a highlighter or an eraser to say these are the parts that are really important more than the others. And these are the parts that we could really do without, but rather your word is true. And so God, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would show us how we should think, how we should feel, how we should behave. And God, help us to follow you in that truth. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You see the uh, sermon title here on the screen, Hostility to Peace. It's a, a message of the gospel. This is one thing that the gospel does. It does many things. But the gospel is what accomplishes peace in our lives. And right now, you can turn on the TV, and I would probably advise against it, and you can find hostility going on in a lot of places. And really, when we think about race, yes, that's the issue that I'm referring to. When we, when we think about that, the, the real problem has to do with the thoughts that go on inside of the individual. That's really where it starts. And if we could get that fixed, everything else flows out of that. And how on earth do we get that fixed? How on earth do we take away that hostility how do we melt it? How do we change it? And the answer is, we don't. There is one who can. And that's the message that we find in the book of Ephesians. 
when the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He's writing to a church that is located in modern-day Turkey. It is a church that has uh, Jews and it has Gentiles in it, but it's primarily a Gentile area. And the, there was this distinction that was there from the Old Testament that we'll get into in a minute. And there are a couple things that he talks about here in this uh, little section that we read that are really significant. And the first one is he talks about the hostility having been abolished. Now, when he says that, you can look back at several points and you can find that here in the text. In verse 14, he says that he has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall. He has broken down that wall that divides into two groups of humanity. He says that Jesus has broken down that wall. When we think about what it means to get rid of that hostility, part of it is getting rid of those barriers that we see, getting rid of that hostile wall in between. In verse 15, he goes on to say, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, and enmity means anger, strife, hostility. And it says that Jesus has abolished that enmity. In verse uh, 16, it says that he has put it to death. He has put to death the enmity. Things that are dead don't come back, right? He's saying he has put that issue to bed forever. So he's broken down the wall. He has abolished the enmity. He has put that hostility to death. And then in verse 19, I think what's really significant is he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. It's interesting because this is written by a Jewish man. He was a Jew. And he's writing to people that are largely Gentiles. And the division between the two was significant. And when people read the Bible, some of them make these sort of wrong assumptions that has to do with what God thinks about races, what God thinks about different kinds of people. We are, in our uh, Sunday morning small groups, we're walking through the Old Testament. And the Old Testament tells the story of God's nation. And when you say things like that, it can come across wrong to people who don't really understand what all you're saying. We can go back to the beginning of that. So God had created the whole world. He created all the people in it. And then there came a point in time when he looked across the world and he reached down to Abram, a man who lived in Ur of the Chaldees. He lived a lot like his neighbors did. And he shows up to Abram and he calls him out. An elderly man with no children. And God's purpose was, I am going to make you the father of many nations. And your offspring will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And he calls Abram out. And what's significant about that is he doesn't call Abram out because of a lot of great qualities about Abram. And if you don't believe me, just read the rest of that story, right? We see his own failings, his own struggles. But he calls Abram out in spite of that. He says, I'm going to take you and I'm going to make you a people of my own. And what God does is he spends the Old Testament showing what it means to belong to the people of God. So what we have today is there are people who believe and trust in Christ who we call Christians. They are the people of God. And they come from all kinds of different countries. They speak all kinds of different languages. And sometimes they are family members with people who are on the other side of that divide. Those who do not believe in Christ, who do not trust in him. And so you have this group of people that are collectively the people of God. We talk about God expanding his kingdom or his family. This is what we're talking about. And so God has established that. And throughout the Old Testament, he had used Abram and his descendants to tell that story. So he plucks him out, and what does he say to him? Go to a land that I will show you. I have no idea how he knew which direction to go. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us that he even told him which way to go. But somehow he leads him over to Israel, what we now know as Israel. That is the promised land, and it's the promised land because God promised to give it to him. 
And what's interesting is he tells Abram, you live here now. You don't live everywhere else. You live here. He says, you will eat these kinds of things, and you will not eat those kinds of things. And uh, thank God we're in a different uh, dispensation where he has given us the freedom to partake of pork, right? Bacon and all the ham, that wonderful. But there were all these laws that God gave, and people will read into that that uh, God somehow doesn't like a pig or that, you know, there are different things. And he, he gave them some things that were helpful to them as a people, and he gave them other things that were just to distinguish them from the nations around them. And within that, he also said, not only are you going to live in this place, but you're going to marry people from this place. And people have taken that to be, oh, you can't marry anybody from a different nation, and all these people are related. And so there's a race. We know Jewish is an ethnicity. And so people have read into Scripture the idea that God hates racial, interracial marriage because of these commands that he had given. Now, these commands were not about interracial marriage. They were about interfaith marriage. Because the only people who worshipped and served him as God was this nation. And if you go and marry somebody who has different values than you, what happens? Eventually, they decide, I am sick and tired of going to church every Sunday, right? I am sick and tired of teaching our kids these things from that book. And so it pulls you away. And so he told his people that you shall marry your people. Now, what's interesting about that is because also throughout the Old Testament, God has shown us exceptions, shall we say, to the general rule. Last week in our Sunday morning small group, we looked at the story of Ruth. Ruth lived in a land called Moab, and Moab was a land that had been cursed by God for the way they had treated his people. And Ruth was a Moabitess woman. Now, there's a story where some Jews end up in her land. She ends up married to one of these guys. He dies, the father dies, and they're going to go back. And she goes back with her mother-in-law and says, Your land will be my land, your people will be your, my people, and your God will be my God. And so what we see throughout the Old Testament is that even though there's this nation, there is also anyone who would trust in him may become a part of that nation. Amen. And that's what Ruth right. does. She believes in Naomi's God, her mother-in-law's God, and she trusts him, and she serves him, and not only does she become a part of that nation, she becomes the grandfather of King David, who was the second king in the history, she's not the grandfather, right? <laughs> Sorry, I saw some weird looks and realized what I said. She becomes like the great-grandmother, and so she is going to be part of this incredible family line that will eventually produce Jesus Christ himself. And in that, God is showing it's about whether or not you trust in me, whether or not you believe in me. It's not, it's not a race game that he's playing. He's calling out a people to trust him and to serve him. And so what you see is that then there has been this hostility that grew up. So that by the time you get, you know, a couple thousand years later to Jesus' day, they're living in Jerusalem, and they have uh, the temple that is there, and they have all these ideas and things. God had told them that there are some things that are clean, and there are other things that are unclean, and they had taken these laws that God gave them that were a point of obedience, and they have turned them into an us versus them distinction. We are the good guys and you are the bad guys. And there was a lot of this attitude between the Jews and the Gentiles. In the temple itself, they had put up a wall down the middle that divided a court where Gentiles could come and where only Jews could come. Go back through the Old Testament. You can look all through it. The examples that God had given and the directions that he gave as to how to build the temple, it ain't in there. And what they did is they have this wall and they put a plaque on it. We have, with archaeology, dug up the plaque, and we can read what it says, and here's what it says. No stranger, remember this word from Ephesians, you who are strangers and aliens? No stranger is to enter within the balustrade around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will, him, will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. That isn't what God told them to put on the wall. That's what they decided to put on the wall. See? 
We can take what's there in Scripture and then we can put it in our own language and we can add to it our own ideas and we can twist it and make it into something that it was never meant to be. And so what you had is this great hostility that's there. And what's interesting is, I think that Paul is referring to that wall when he says that Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility between you. We don't worship God in Jerusalem at that temple anymore. That's right. If you walk there and you're walking through it and you want to worship God, you can or walking through where it used to be, right? You can go to the place and you can worship God, but you don't have to in these pilgrimages that you had to make certain times of the year. You know why we don't do that anymore? Because Jesus has come and has died and in so doing has opened up the access to God. And in the process of that, this dividing wall of hostility comes down. And so, how do we get rid of the hostility? Jesus does that. And he does it through the cross. The second thing that we see that happens here is that not only does he break down the hostility, but he actually unites us. It's one thing to get rid of the hostility, but it's another thing to unite the people. And so, in verse 13, he says, You who were far off have been brought near bringing you in. In verse 14, he says, he has made the two groups into one. So there aren't two groups anymore. Now there is only one group. In verse 15, he says that he has made them a new man, which means a new race of people. Jesus has created a new race called Christians. It's unbelievably significant. He said that that was the way in which he created peace. Because now that they're together, there is peace. In verse 16, they were reconciled together in one body. In verse 17, he's, Jesus has preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. It's the same gospel message to both. In verse 18, they were joined together in one spirit. In verse 19, he talks about them being made into countrymen. They're now in that same nation together. And also in verse 19, he refers to us being family now. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens and members of God's household. This is the way God feels about the issue. It's so significant that he sent Jesus from heaven to earth to walk among us, to live among us, and to be perfect. Because we all, regardless of who our parents were, or what nation we live in, what language we speak, have sinned against him. And we need forgiveness. And so we sent Christ to live that perfect life in our place and to die that sinless death in our place. And one of the byproducts of that is that the hostility comes down. The two groups are made into one, and there is peace. Or at least, there should be. He has died for it. He has created this new nation. You know, there, there are a lot of areas in life where there is difficulty and there's uh, strife. And when you have that strife between you, it exists for all kinds of different reasons, right? You've got... Uh, sports teams and there'll be this rivalry in between you. You ever notice like when a guy from the Red Sox gets traded to the Yankees and you go, well, how does that work? Well, they're going to get along eventually when they are on the same team, right? You have nations that are at war and then if they should combine into a new kingdom, that's the thing that establishes peace. You have companies that may be uh, competing with one another until the merger and then when the merger happens, they stop competing, or at least they're supposed to, right? Sometimes you have the lingering effects when there is no ground for it. And so there is this huge event that has taken place that has dramatically changed the circumstance. You know, growing up, when I went to family reunions, there were only white people at the family reunions, right? 
And that's not because we had some rule against anybody else coming. It's just who our family was, right? And now I can say a sentence like, all of my nieces and nephews are black, which is an interesting sentence to say. Something significant has happened in my family, right? There's a huge event that has taken place. There is adoption that has taken place. There is marriage that has taken place, and it caused us dramatic change. In Scripture, there is a huge event that has taken place that has dramatically changed how we relate to people of other races. And what is this huge, dramatic event? We get clues of it in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 13, it says, But now in Christ you who were far away have been brought near. And it has happened by the blood of Christ. He says in verse 13. In verse 14, he himself is our peace. In verse 15, he abolished in his flesh the enmity. In verse 16, that he reconciled both in one body to God through the cross. So they come together through that. In verse 18, for through him we both have access. It's all about in him and by him and through him, through his blood, through the cross. The major event that has changed the way we should relate to people from other races is the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because in the cross, he has died for our sins. No matter what the color of our skin is, no matter what language we speak, no matter what nation we call home. And so he has broken down the hostility and he has created peace by the cross. Amen. When we think about this major event, this isn't just the major event on this one front. This is the major event in all of human history. We divide time on the life of Jesus Christ. That's right. B.C. and A.D. And so this is this huge monumental event where he has changed what took place before. He has fulfilled all the promises that were there. And in so doing, he has reconciled us together. He has made peace in this uh, action. No matter who you are or what country you belong to, there are now two kinds of people in the world. There are those who belong to Christ, who trust in him, who believe in him, have their sins washed away by his blood, and those who haven't. And all the other distinctions are rather superficial. Even if those other distinctions have a dramatic effect on what life looks like. And let's be honest, they do a lot of time, right? Because there's still that lingering effect. The companies have been merged, but the people still remember which company they came from, and there's still this sort of squabble, right? The guy has been traded to the new team, and yet they still remember the elbow that got thrown in last year's game, right? And so there's this lingering effect, and you wonder, did they have this kind of an issue in the New Testament? Did they have this kind of a lingering effect between Jews and Gentiles? And the answer is yes, they did. The way that we should treat people is no matter who you are, no matter what your background, if you believe in Jesus and I believe in Jesus, we are co-heirs of the kingdom of God. We are brothers and sisters in his family, regardless of where you come from. So is this just the message of the book of Ephesians? <laughs> Not hardly. In Galatians chapter 3, we can read these words in verses 27 through 29. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs, according to the promise. Amen. Boy, that's some strong language, isn't it? 1 Corinthians, we find it again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, listen to what is said in verse 13. 
For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. 1 Corinthians opens with Paul saying, I hear that there are divisions among you. And then here he's saying, because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, he has made peace. And so we are one flesh, one body, one spirit. In Colossians chapter 3, in verses uh, 11 and 12, listen to what he says to the church in Colossae. Colossians 3, 11 through 12 says, A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, He's talking about the way we relate to one another, and that has been accomplished by Jesus Christ. He is the one who has made the peace, and he describes them as, you know, God's chosen people. Now there's no distinction between them, but Christ is all and is in all. When we sang that song earlier, he is all to us. You know who us is? Anybody who trusts him. Anybody who believes in him. Anywhere in the world. Again, in the book of Romans, he says this another time. In Romans chapter 10, when we read verses 11 through 13, listen to what he says to the church in Rome. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever, whoever, anyone. Get that language? Now what's significant about these, there's a, a, a few things that are similar, two in particular that I want to point out. We read from Ephesians, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, Colossians, and Romans. A couple things that are significant. All of those letters are written by Paul, a Jewish man, who was, as he described it, a missionary to the Gentiles. God has tasked me with the important ministry of going out to the nations. When Jesus said to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven that they will be his witnesses in all Jerusalem, the city where he was, Judea, that region, Samaria, the nearby region, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He didn't also mean Galilee. He meant everywhere on the earth. And the uttermost parts of the earth has been going on for a couple of thousand years since then. That's why we every week are praying for missionaries who are going to the uttermost parts of the world to carry this message of truth. So it's Paul writing this, but it's also interesting that each and every one of these places, I had a map but the map was glitchy on the screen, so we can't point that out. The nation of Israel was where God's people were, right? And that's where the, the Jews were, and every other nation was Gentiles. And what's significant about all of these letters, they're written to Rome in Italy, Corinth in Greece, and then Ephesus, Colossae, and Galatia all in Turkey. Ain't one of them places anywhere in Jerusalem or Israel. This is not the nation that considered themselves God's people. He, as a Jewish believer in Christ, is writing to all these Gentile believers in Christ and saying, you have just as much standing here as I do. You are here in this family with me. You are in this nation with me. And you got here by the blood of Jesus Christ. By his death on the cross, he has broken down the hostility and has united us together into one race, into one people. And when we think about how do we relate to the race issue, people have different responses to it. And sadly, there are people who have used Christianity and the Bible as justification for believing that certain kinds of people are better, more valuable, 
somehow superior to other kinds of people. It's tragic that people would do that. It's sinful that people would do that. I would also say it's kind of ignorant because the Bible shows us clearly Jesus died for people from every, how is it that it's put in the book of Revelation? Every nation, every tribe, every people, every tongue. And he is the one who has broken down the hostility. And he is the one who makes peace. And so the ground on which we stand, if you want to stand up against the, the feelings and the inward attitude and the outward actions of racism or sexism, or any other kind of divisions that people want to drive between people. The ground that we stand on to say that's wrong is at the foot of the cross. It is because of what Jesus has done for us that he has made the two groups into one. He has established peace by his blood because we were all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Christ has come and died for us, and he has made a new race of people. So there are two distinctions of humanity now. There are brothers and sisters in Christ, and potential brothers and sisters in Christ. Because even those who don't believe in Jesus, and therefore don't belong to his family or his nation, they can. And so when you look at someone, it's, it's easy to have animosity toward people who treat you poorly or people who have different ideas that, than you. But ultimately, that can change. That can be utterly different. When Ruth was born in Moab, there was like a one in five billion percent chance that she could possibly end up a Jew much less in the genealogy in the line of Jesus. And yet, it happens. So the people that you look at and say, I'll never be able to get along with that person, that's just not a gospel mindset. So we have to look at people and see them for what they are. It doesn't matter what language they speak, what cultural behavior uh, is there in them, what their background is, who their parents are, the tone of their skin. None of that stuff matters. You look at who they are, and that is they are a human being created in the image of God. And they might believe in Jesus. And if they do, they're a brother or sister. And if they don't, they might believe in him later and become a brother or sister. And so we treat them with honor and with respect and with love. The reason that we as Christians aren't racists is because Jesus has died for us all. He is the one who broke down the hostility. And if you want to raise that wall back up, you're going directly against Christ. This is the ground for our love for one another. This is the reason why we take this good news to people in all kinds of different countries. And we also take it to the, the family members that we have strife with and the neighbors that you're having squabbles with. And we take it to the people that are of a different background and they're strange and you might feel uncomfortable. We carry the same attitude and the same message. Believe in Jesus. And you will be one with me in God's family forever. So I wonder for you if you're struggling with these feelings. If you've struggled with how to put it in conversation with others. This is the truth of God's word where he has shown us how he feels about the issue. And he has called us to repent if this isn't our attitude and to turn back to this way, this truth, and to live this out among a world where there is so much hostility. And it doesn't matter if the hostility has to do with race or if it has to do with gender or if it just has to do with people that are different than you. 
the way that we make the move from hostility to peace is the cross of Jesus Christ to see people as a child of God in his image who can be adopted into his family. So that's what we need this morning. That's what's going to bring about peace in our time. We want to stand together. We're going to pray. And if God is stirring something in you that you need to pray with me about or ask the church to pray with you, I'll be here to greet you if you want to come. If you just want to do business with the Lord where you are, to really search our hearts and say, God, do I need to let down the hostility and come to peace with others? If that's you, do that business with the Lord this morning. Let's pray together and then we'll sing. God, we thank you for your word, for the truth of it, that you didn't leave us guessing on so many issues. And you've given us such good reasons to find peace. And God, we pray that you might help us to live that way, to carry the attitude that you desire. God, if repentance is needed, we pray that you would give us the strength to do it. God, we pray that you might help us to carry that heart of compassion and love our fellow man, along with the good news that you have died for sinners in every nation, every tribe, every tongue. God, we thank you for that. We love you that this gospel is true. And it's in your name that we ask all these things. Amen. As we're standing to sing this morning, if you want to pray with me or make something known to the church, you can do that as we stand to sing. Wednesday night, we're going to gather for small groups, for Bible study and prayer. We would love to have you here for that. We've got kids uh, and adults that we kind of divide up into. That's at 6.30, and we'd love to have you here for that. Uh, don't forget, VBS is coming up in July, and be sure and uh, encourage one another. Uh, send a card, send a text, make a phone call, and let people know that you care about them, that you're praying for them, all right? We're going to close our time of worship by singing our way out of here this morning. Let's lift up the Lord and cling to Him together.